All right, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Chase Bolster, and I am the youth pastor here at Lakes Community Church, and I have the great honor and privilege of bringing you the word of the Lord this morning. But before we get into that, uh, I have a few announcements to make. So number one, this Wednesday is a laser tag night for the youth group. So the entire youth group, yeah, you can be excited about it, it's okay. So the entire youth group is gonna be going down to Laser Max downtown. So we're gonna be meeting here at this building at five o'clock. Um, and then we will be back here at nine. So we'll be leaving the church at 5.30. I'm asking the students to be here at five o'clock, so they actually all get here on time. But we'll be leaving here at 5.30, and we'll be getting back here to the church at nine. Uh, your students will need two things in order to go. One is a medical release form that we have to have signed um, every year in order for the students to be able to leave with us. And then number two is that Laser Max requires their own little liability waiver. So if you have a student that wants to go, um, and it's okay if it's their first time being at youth group, that's a great time to get to know everybody is to shoot them with some lasers. It's a fun time. Um, if they want to come, come and talk to myself or my wife, Caitlin. She's holding my cute son right there. Um, so if you want to get signed up, come and talk to one of us. We'll make sure that you guys are able to get going. Also, we ask that the students bring $5 with them so that way uh, we can purchase dinner for everybody and have some pizza while we're down there. So that's going to be this week. Um, and then also... I just want you guys to look at your bulletins really quick, and you have this little insert. Please look at that, um, because uh, Ms. Kimberly has some needs in almost every single, I think it's every single class, um, they, they need some help in there. So please be praying about that if you're willing to serve the youth, because you know we, we need to raise up the next generation in, in the ways of the Lord. Um, so those are our announcements for you today. Otherwise, let's, let's pray, and then we can, we can dive in together. So, Father God, we just want to invite you here and Father, I just ask that you would please be here and be in my words, Father. If I have my own soapbox, if I have my own desires, Lord, I just pray that you help me to step away from that and just speak your truths today, Father. And Lord, I just ask that you be um, preparing all of our hearts and minds to be able to hear from you and to receive some hope and to receive some joy in you and that we would remember to keep our eyes on you, Father. God, thank you for this day. May we pray. Amen. Okay. So um, I do just want to say, like, good job on the prayer circles. Uh, you know, both services, I had to end the prayer short, which I think is a great sign. I think that's good. And if it's a little weird for you, um, I ask you to hang in there. You know, whenever we do something new, we always are a little resistant to it. At least I know I am. It's just human nature. We don't want to do what we're not used to. But this is a great way where we don't just come to church, but we can be the church. Right, so we want to make church a verb, right? We want to be the church. So this is a great way where we can be the church. Uh, you know, as Scott said, this isn't a time for us to be able to get into the nitty-gritty details of our prayer needs, but that's what small groups are for. So if you're able to get into a small group or something, you'll have some people that are around you that can pray for you, and then Sunday mornings are just kind of like a, a broad prayer. So anyways, I just hope that you guys enjoy that, and if you didn't like it, I hope that you'll just keep giving it more chances until you do like it, um, because we're going to be doing it for a while, so I hope you, I hope you end up liking it, so... Anyways, um, we want to be the church. We don't just want to participate in church. We want to be the church. Amen. Amen. Okay. So one of the aspects of being a youth pastor is I try to bridge the gap between the youth and the main congregation. That's one of my goals. I have to try to, try to merge these two churches. And, and that's actually one of the things that I don't want to have happen is have like a Wednesday night church and a Sunday morning church, right? We, just, we, won't, we don't want to be two churches in one building. We want to be one church. Amen. So one of our goals this morning is going to be trying to bridge that gap. So as you can see, the, the title of my sermon is Resilient Sunday Edition, because this is actually the sermon or a version of the sermon that I gave up at Spring Retreat, which we had titled Resilient, right? So this, that was our theme for retreat. We were wanting to figure out what it means to be resilient in Christ and to live resilient lives as Christ lived a resilient life. So I want to walk through that with you today as well, so that way you have um, a form of... of commonality with maybe some kids in the youth group. And so we have a bunch of youth here who are wearing the resilient t-shirts because they're hyped about going to church and loving Jesus, right? So, and I want you guys to be able to be on that same page and give you something to maybe be able to communicate a little bit better with some of the youth and the church. And so this is, this is a goal that we have as a, as a leadership team is we want to be able to, to successfully merge the youth into the main congregation body. We want to be a multi-generational church in pursuit of Jesus Christ. That's one of our goals, I know that Josh and Jeremy share in that goal because they were willing to learn, I thank God, in one week. I think I texted them on a Tuesday, and they're like, all right, I'll learn it on Thursday, and then they played it for a Sunday. It was one of the songs. It was like the theme song for retreat. All the students absolutely loved I Thank God. It was the very first worship song we worshiped to today. They absolutely loved it. And so Josh and Jeremy, they're bought in on this, this, 
this vision of trying to unify the youth and the main congregation. And I hope that you guys will be bought in on it if you're not already there. I hope that by the end of today, you guys will be like, all right, this is what we need to be doing. So that's one of my goals, and I just want to be straight with you about that, is I want you to buy into the vision of having a multi-generational church that's pursuing Jesus together. So I think that that's a beautiful thing. Amen. Okay. So that being said, we have two main goals in mind this morning. Number one, I want us to be able to see Jesus more clearly in our daily lives. And number two, I want to bridge that gap. Okay? I want to better connect the youth and the main congregation together by sharing this message, message with you. So we'll get into it. And in this, we're going to learn what it means to be resilient in Christ. That's our pursuit today to see Jesus more clearly, and to better connect the youth and the young adults. And I think that we'll achieve those two goals by learning what it means to be resilient. So we'll start with what our verse, our our key verse for the weekend, which was Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We have it on the very bottom of our shirts. That way the students never, never forget, and I never forget. But let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We'll read it together. And when you get there, go ahead and say amen, so I know that you're there. Amen. Excellent. Man, a lot of people are winning today. So it's actually a race, just in case you didn't know. So whoever can get there first is more holy than everybody else. Um, At least that's what we teach them in the youth group. So no, (laughs) no, but it's a game that we like to play in the youth group. So you can say amen, or you can cheat and use the screen, but that's for cheaters. But okay, it's whatever. All right. Don't worry, I use the screen most Sundays. So uh, therefore, let's read it together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is alive and well and in power. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, we get a picture here. Now, I would encourage you to go back and read Hebrews chapter 11, because that's the cloud of witnesses that he's talking about. So if you want to understand the cloud of witnesses a little bit better, go read Hebrews 11. We don't have time to walk through it all today, uh, so I just trust that you will be willing to do that. At least I hope you will. But anyways, we get a picture here, and the picture is to actively pursue Jesus Christ in two main ways. So in way number one, it talks about us running a race, right? This is, this is what Paul was talking about. He's saying, you know, we've all been given a race to run. We all have tasks that Jesus Christ has given us to do. We have a mission. All of us have the mission of, of sharing the gospel with other people, but also in our lives, sometimes it looks different. You know, you'll, you'll be able to, to speak to four or five people that you work with, or maybe God will make you a pastor and you get to preach on Sunday mornings and everybody's trapped and has to listen to you. You know, it's, it's one of those two things, right? You, but we've, we're all given a task to do, right? We're all given our race to run. Now, we have Bloomsday coming up, right? I think it's May 11th. May 1st. I added a one. It's May 1st. How far do you guys think I'm going to make it in Bloomsday with these two 25-pound plate weights? 10 feet. feet. I hope I can make it more than 10 feet, but I don't know. First service had a lot more faith in me. (laughs) But I'm not going to make it very far, right? If I'm trying to run Bloomsday and I'm holding these weights, I mean, I can already feel it in my shoulders. I can still, I can feel it in my forearms. Maybe I held them too long in first service. I don't know, but I can already feel the weight straining me. What if I'm trying to worship God while I'm holding these weights? Clapping is really difficult. I don't even want to try it, even though I was tempted. (laughs) If we're holding on to these weights, we can't run the race that God has given us. If we're holding on to this, we are too busy holding on to this to be able to do what Jesus Christ has commanded us to do. And so if we're actually trying to pursue Jesus, we're like, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm mean, Actually, that's, that's real breathing. Um, <laughs> we need to actively remove these, win- these, these sins and these hindrances. See, these, these weights, these are the sins and the hindrances. These are the things that stop us from getting close to God. These are the things that we're holding on to that Jesus is like, just let go and follow me. These are the sins that, that we feel trapped in. These are, these are the, the things that, that we enjoy that maybe aren't glorifying to God. These are the things that, that we desperately want, but God says this isn't healthy for you. These are the things that, that we willingly pick up and we willingly hold on to 
So therefore, we are willingly failing in our race. See, our command here in Hebrews, one of the two ways that we're, that we're given this picture of pursuing God is we have to lay our sins and our hindrances aside. Let them go. Put them down. Because now I can run my race. I can run my race now. See, I've, I've let go of it. This is what we're told to do. If we want to be pursuing Jesus, if we want to see him clearly in our daily lives, we need to put our sins and our hindrances and our weights aside. We need to take the things that are blocking us from seeing Jesus, from being with Jesus, from pursuing Jesus, and we need to get rid of them so they don't hinder us anymore. Because that's what a hindrance is, right? It's something that stops us, blocks us from being with God. So this is something that we're actively told to do. This is our choice. It's not like anybody just walks up and hands you these weights and says, hey, now you have to hold on to this. These are things that we willingly and willfully pick up and hold on to so that we cannot accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish. Because I can't even turn the page to see the rest of my notes right now. If I try to do that, I'm just going to knock my entire stand over, right? I can't even preach a sermon while holding on to these weights. What's hindering me? So what's hindering you? What do you need to let go of? And I encourage you that once you let them go, don't pick them back up. Because that's what we like to do as humans. We like to, to walk. We'll be like, yeah, I'm running my race. I'm doing really good. So you know what? I can hold on to maybe one of these. I can still run my race with one. That's a lot easier. But it's still a hindrance. I mean, we do this all too often, where we just, we try to pick something up. We're like, all right, I'm doing so good, I can go back to what was hindering me before. But don't do it. What we're seeing here, this picture that we're getting in Hebrews, is to let it go for Jesus. Just let it go. Actively remove the sin and hindrances or weights from your life. Now, the second thing that we see, number two, or, or letter B, is to keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. See, we've got to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to see Jesus so clearly. And, you know, I brought up these weights so because I wanted you guys to remember me carrying around some weights on, on Sunday morning. So you're like, okay, that's kind of weird, but I get what he's trying to do. But now I want to be able to give you like a mind picture, a mind image, if you will, of what it means to keep your eyes on Jesus. And so this is what it is. It's B I. Um, it's called target fixation. And it is an intentional phenomenon observed in humans in which an individual becomes so focused on an object, be it a target or hazard, that they inadvertently increase the risk of colliding with that object. And this is actually most often associated with people who ride motorcycles because where you look is where you kind of orientate your balance from what I understand. So if you're like looking at that tree, you kind of slowly go towards that tree. And it's the same thing when you're driving a car. I mean, how many times has there been an accident, like, three roads over, not even on the freeway, but the freeway's at a standstill because everybody's like, what's that? <laughs> they slow down, and, and they can't even drive straight anymore on the freeway because they're too busy looking at something else. And so what I want to do is, even though this is typically associated with driving vehicles at high speeds, I want us to be able to take this and make it into a thing where we can focus on Jesus and get your target fixation on Jesus, because here's the thing, if you're driving down the road and you notice yourself starting to drift, I want you to think, oh, I need to be thinking about Jesus. <laughs> That's what I want to have happen. So, so this target fixation, I want you to be so focused on Jesus, because this is what Hebrews, Hebrews 12 is telling us to do, is keeping our eyes on Jesus, we need to be so focused on Jesus that we increase our chance of colliding with him, that we increase our chance of running into him. That's how focused we need to be on Jesus, that he is the one that we are constantly focusing on. Because here's the thing, if you're running a race, right, if you're in Bloomsday and you forget why you're running Bloomsday, are you actually going to complete that race? No. I don't think you will, at least. If you don't remember why you're doing it or if you don't remember where you're going, you're not going to be able to finish your race very well. If you forget, as a Christian, why you're running your Christian race, if you... If your eyes are no longer on Jesus and no longer on the prize, your race is going to be so much more difficult because you will not remember why you're doing what you're doing. So we are called not only to toss aside the things that hinder us from seeing Jesus, but we're also called to constantly 
and persistently keep our eyes just glued on to Jesus. We need to peel ourselves away from everything else that could be distracting us, which are the hindrances, those are the distractions, get rid of those, and just see Jesus so that you collide with Jesus. Amen? Amen. So those are the two ways in Hebrews that we see we need to be pursuing God. So we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about Christian suffering really quick. We'll tie it all back in later. But number two, Christians can have joy in suffering. Christians can have joy in suffering. So constantly keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ continually reminds us of the suffering he endured so that we could have a relationship with him, right? And we took communion. We remembered the suffering of Christ. That's what communion's about. It's about remembering what Christ has done for us so that way we can remain focused in our faith and in our mission and stay focused on our race. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 5, and don't forget to say amen when you get there. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Amen. So, the youth group has been walking through Romans verse by verse. That's what our study has been lately. And actually, this is what we studied right before we went up to retreat. And so I just want to say that this is an amazing thing. This is where God was showing up, preparing the hearts of the students to be able to see what it means to be resilient, because this is what we studied right before going to learn about resiliency. And this is, it's all about faith triumphing over trouble. And it says this, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse three, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You see how that ties into being resilient? See, when, when we have struggles, when we have suffering, when we have trials, it produces perseverance. And then from perseverance, we have character. And from character, hopefully, we get some hope. And our hope will not be disappointed. You see, it's actually because of my wife that the theme was resilient. Um, that was something that I believe God spoke to her, and then she shared it with me, and we prayed about it, and we're like, all right, this is what, this is what the theme of the, the weekend should be. And that's why I'm here preaching the Sermon on Resiliency right now. But you see, Caitlin and I have gone through some struggles in the past six months or a year. You know, we've, we've had some, some issues within the family. We've lost some really close friends. Um, not like they died. They're just no longer friends. Sorry, I should have phrased that better. <laughs> lost some really close friendships, but then we've also lost a couple children. See, we had a couple miscarriages before we finally had Silas. And you know, when you're in the middle of that type of suffering, because I know we're not alone, it's a pretty common thing, unfortunately. But when you're in the middle of that suffering, it's hard to hold on to the promise of God saying that all things will work together for the good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose, right? We see that promise in Romans 8, 28. It's hard to hold on to that promise for yourself when you're in the middle of that type of suffering. It's a difficult thing to do. And yet Christians can have joy in suffering. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to be happy about the pain that we experience. It doesn't mean that we're like, yes, I get to go through more suffering. Yay me. Right? Because that's psychotic. You see, what it means to have joy in suffering is, is our joy is in the Lord. It's not in our circumstances. So even though we were suffering, we were still able to glorify God and say, God, I love you because, God, you are worthy of praise no matter what I'm going through. Jesus, it doesn't matter what suffering I'm going through. I'm going to glorify you because you are the God of creation and you deserve my praise and my worship and I will not be shaken from loving you because of what's going on around me. 
That's what it means to have joy in tribulations. That's what it means when we read in in Romans 5, to glory in tribulations. We are still going to glorify God no matter what we're going through, and that's what we're called to do as Christians. Amen. Not as enthusiastic about that, amen. (laughs) Joy in suffering does not mean, mean being joyful about pain, but about keeping our joy in Christ through all suffering. That's a hard lesson to learn, but I think it's worth it. And even though in the time I had no idea, I was like, God, how in the world are you going to use the loss of our child for our good? So you don't know how that's going to play out in those moments. But I know that God has given us some perseverance, hopefully given us some character, and he's definitely our hope. We've trusted in that promise, and I hope that you'll trust in that promise too. So I'll say, number three, trusting in God and maturing in our faith daily makes us resilient. Can you also go to the uh, definition of resilient, please? So resilient means able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. So when I was thinking about being resilient, I thought about dodgeball. You're supposed to be pretty resilient when you play dodgeball, right? Um, little known fact, uh, when Caitlin and I, before we were together, when she was too pretty to talk to because I was nervous, I hit her in the face with the dodgeball and made her cry. And I was like, I like you, please don't go away. Anyways, <laughs> that was like 14 years ago. Okay, but anyways, <laughs> being resilient, it's kind of like this dodgeball. See, the world will come and its troubles will push us down. Sorry, didn't mean to get that air in the mic. I did that last time too. It pushes us down, it compresses us, the troubles, they hit us, and they change where we're at. This dodgeball no longer looks like it was, right? It is smushed down under the pressure. But what happens when I let go? It bounces back. It reforms its shape. There's still a little bit of indentation from how I smushed it, but it's back. It's what it's supposed to be. Because nobody wants to play dodgeball with a flat little disc like this. That's not fun. But you see, this is our picture of resiliency. We smush this down. This is the world. This is pressing you down. These are the troubles that you have. They're pressing you down. The suffering that you've had in your life is pressing you down. The betrayals, the loss, the pain, whatever it is. But in Jesus Christ, when we have him as our Lord and Savior, we're able to come back from all of the things that might try to crush us in this world. We are able to bounce back in Christ Why? Because Christ himself was resilient. Christ himself bounced back. He came back even better. Right? So so when the world tried to smash Christ down, and and believe me, Christ had a lot of pressure put on him. Right? Like, Christ wasn't this unmovable, unaffected individual. Christ was pressed down by these troubles, as we'll see. But he came back, and so we can too. He, He wasn't permanently changed by the things that affected him, right? And we don't have to be permanently damaged by the things that try to press us down. We can have healing in Christ. And so like most important things to understand, it's modeled for us in scripture. So Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of being resilient. And by the way, I will say that having Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior will make you emotionally and spiritually resilient. And without Jesus Christ, I don't know how you can make it through this world. So Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of being resilient. And let's turn to Matthew chapter 26 together. Don't forget to say amen. Encourage those people around you in pursuing the Lord. You guys are cheating using the screen. Okay. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, amen. I saved the verse so I could beat you. (laughs) Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there to pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them that my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Then he came back to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So when he left them, he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you sleeping and resting? Sorry, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus Christ was so sad that he could have died. That's what the text says. He was so sad to the point of death. I mean, have you guys ever been in a point in your life where you're like, I'm just done? I'm done with this. I don't want to deal with this. It's just better if I'm not even here right now. Like, I'm just so fed up and done with this. Am I the only one that's ever been there? Right? Like, where you get to the point where your back hits the wall, you slide to the ground, you're just like, I'm done. This is where Jesus was. See, Jesus was getting pressed down. We'll see that, that he, he does bounce back, right? Because he's, he's our ultimate example. But he was getting pressed down. Jesus was sorrowful to the point of death. And, and as Christians, as people who believe in Jesus Christ as being our Lord and Savior and understanding him to be God, this fact should hit, hit us really hard that Jesus Christ was sorrowful to the point of death. I mean, he was there at the beginning of creation. It was through Jesus Christ that everything was created. He is the master of everything, and yet he was sorrowful to the point of death. This should be shocking to us. This should make us pause and say, hmm, If Jesus Christ was suffering like this, what does that tell me about my suffering? God suffered. I mean, what would it take to make God suffer to the point of death? The rest of this sermon is going to be kind of like a bad infomercial. It's going to be like that thing where it's like, but wait, there's more. Because I want us to walk through everything that Jesus suffered together. We just did that during Easter, but I want us to do it again, because understanding Jesus' suffering will help us understand our own suffering better. It will help us keep our eyes on the prize, and it will help us see Jesus more clearly in our daily lives. That's our goal today. So not only was Jesus in this garden deeply emotionally distressed to the point of death, but he brought along his buddies because, you know, his buddies are going to help him get through this difficult time, because they will pray with him and be there for him. But what happens when Jesus comes over here and prays He comes back, and and what are his disciples doing? Some of his best friends that he's been with for three years now, they're sleeping. Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Like, do you understand what's going on right now? Do you understand where my emotional state is? I mean, when Caitlin and I were going through our suffering, praise the Lord that we had friends that were able to come alongside us and help us through our struggles. I don't know how difficult it would be to try to get through deep loss and deep suffering without friends being next to you. I don't know how that would go. I don't want to ever find out how that would go. But Jesus had to go through that. See, his friends, they weren't there for him because not once, not twice, but it was three times they were falling asleep and not being there for him when he needed them the most. How devastating is that in your deepest hour, most darkest hour of need, and your friends are sleeping on the job? I hope you have to imagine that type of pain. I hope that you can't fully understand that pain. Because that seems like a deep, deep emotional pain. But wait, there's more. Not only that, but also one of his friends that he'd been traveling for three years came up and, and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. I mean, talk about a slap in the face and a knife in the back. I mean, this was the guy that Jesus entrusted his finances to. You typically trust the people that you give your money to. What did Judas do? He betrayed him and stabbed him in the back. But wait, there's more. Not only that, but then Jesus went to an illegal trial in the middle of the night where the judge, who's just supposed to hear both sides, was actually accusing Jesus. So not only was Jesus in this illegal trial after his friends were sleeping on him and one of his best friends betrayed him with a kiss, now he's in this illegal, unjust trial 
And Peter's actually standing off to the side denying Jesus in the middle of this. About a year or two ago, I don't remember exactly how long I got to preach a sermon on Peter's denial. And in researching that, I came to find out that it's more than likely that Peter was in earshot of Jesus during Jesus' trial. So when we're told in one of the Gospels that Peter started cursing and swearing, saying, I do not know Jesus, Jesus probably heard him. So could you imagine Jesus is now standing in this unjust trial, and then over here he hears his right-hand man denying him, swearing up and down that he has no idea who Jesus is. How painful is that? To in your deepest hour of need, everybody that you know and love abandons you. But wait, there's more. See, after that illegal trial, Jesus is then given over to Pontius Pilate, who then, even though he finds Jesus as being guiltless, still condemns Jesus to death for political purposes. Talk about injustice. Watching Barabbas the guilty walk free while the guiltless Jesus gets to be hung on a tree. But wait, there's more because after that, Jesus was handed over to the Roman brutes who then beat him and then he was whipped and scourged and they use a cat and nine tail that they put glass or metal or whatever they can in the ends of the whip so when they whip him, it tears all the flesh from his back and just leaves his back in ribbons. But wait, there's more. Because after they were done doing that, they took a crown of thorns and they beat it into his head with a rod and then put a robe around his shoulders and mocked him. The creator of all things was being mocked and beaten by his creation. And so then once they took the robe off of him, it just reopened all the wounds on his back again. And then Jesus is so weak at this point that he couldn't even carry his own cross. But then wait, there's more because he gets to... He was nailed to that cross. And and the nails going through his wrist in between the bones and his wrist hitting that nerve cluster. I don't want to ever know that pain. And then there Jesus slowly died from suffocation. But wait, there's more. Because his creation continued to mock him all the while he was on the cross. And then finally, when Jesus was about to die, we see probably some of the most pain that could ever be experienced. Probably. Probably is Jesus crying out saying, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And he's pointing us to the Psalms, but I also think that it's giving us a a lens into what's happening between Jesus and the father, seeing this spiritual pain, this, this separation. What is it like for the son to be separated from the father? I don't know. What is it like for the son to have the wrath of the father poured on him? I don't know. So Jesus, he suffered deep emotional pain. He suffered extreme physical pain, and he suffered unknowable spiritual pain. But you know what? Jesus kept his eyes on the Father. Jesus kept his eyes on what the Father's plan was for him. See, Jesus was saying, Father, not your will, but my will. And I'll say that one of the reasons why the Garden of Gethsemane was so painful for Jesus is because he knew everything that was about to happen to him. See, I firmly believe that he knew what was going to happen. He said, don't, you know, if if you can, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but your will. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And yet he did it anyways. And if that's not a picture of being resilient, then I don't know what is. Jesus was crushed down by everything around him. And yet he came back because he was trusting in the Father's plan. See, he was trusting in the Father's promises. See, I think that that promise that all things will work together for the good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, I think that was one of the things that kept Jesus' eyes on the Father. See, it's because of Jesus' suffering that we can have a relationship with God and that we can take hold of that promise. See, it's only through Jesus that we can have that promise. Amen? Only because of what he did on the cross and rising from the grave, that if we put our faith in him and believe that he was resurrected three days later, if we confess our faith and if we believe, we're saved. Right? We, we have him for eternity. See, this is why Jesus did what he did. He was resilient and he pursued the Father's plan. He ran the race that the Father gave to him. See, Jesus, he set aside those hindrances. He said, not my will, but your will, Father. He tossed those hindrances aside and he kept his eyes on the Father, saying, Father, your will be done, not my will. And it's because he did those things that he was resilient, that he was able to bounce back. See, Christ kept his eyes on the Father, stayed resilient through all of his trials. And I want to say that if Christ remained resilient, then through him, so can we. Through the power of the blood of Jesus, through Jesus Christ himself, we can be resilient through all of our struggles, through the loss of a child, through family struggles, 
through whatever suffering you are going through, if you keep your eyes on Jesus and pursue him daily, you'll make it through. Understanding that you can have joy in that suffering because of who God is. Not because you're happy about the suffering, but because you're happy about who God is. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus and actively remove all hindrances from your life. Maintain your joy in Christ through suffering. And guys, trusting in God will never disappoint us. It really won't. And, and just that, that verse in Romans where it says, the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I love that. That is such a beautiful picture for us of what it means to live in Christ and, and the type of hope that we can have. Trusting in God will never disappoint. And being resilient, sorry, be resilient as Christ is resilient. And I'll add, trust your entire life to Christ. Now, what should you do with this sermon? What should you do with the information that I've presented to you today? One, I want you to see Jesus more clearly in your daily life, which means actively removing those hindrances from your life. We all have hindrances and we all willingly pull them up, right? I'm no exception. This is something that I struggle with. I still struggle with picking up things that hinder me and then putting them back down and then picking them back up and putting them back down, right? I think that's part of being human, but we're called to actively put them aside and we can do that through the power of Jesus Christ. So put those hindrances aside and keep your eyes on Jesus. How do you keep your eyes on Jesus? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but one of the ways is being the church. And so what I want to encourage you to do today is talk with some of the youth, Reach out, say hi. You know, one of the reasons why we have bad retention with the youth in the church is because they don't feel like there's a place to belong. So reach out. You now have some common ground with the youth in the church. You've now heard a very similar sermon to what they heard during retreat. Go up and say, hey, what have you learned about resiliency? What have you learned? What have you been doing? How, how have you gotten to know God a little bit more through this? Because we had four kids get saved up there. They're now know, they now know Jesus. And you know that first song we said, hell lost another one, I am free. Four people got to sing that genuinely up at retreat. That's a beautiful thing. So go up and say hi, talk to them, but get to know them. That's my encouragement to you. That's what the sermon is about, keeping your eyes on Jesus and being the church. So can we do that? Yeah. Amen. All right, let's pray. Well, Father, we just want to say thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here. And Lord, thank you for who you are. And Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you for all the suffering that you went for our sakes. That you went through so that we could know you. Thank you, Father, that you gave this cup to Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for taking it for our sakes. Lord, thank you for making a way when there was no way Lord, please be actively showing us what we need to do to, to get rid of these hindrances in our lives, Lord. Please remind us constantly when we're driving down the road or whatever we're doing to keep our eyes on you, Lord, that we would run the race that you've given us. And Lord, please make us the church that you want us to be. In your name we pray, amen. Oh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you today and give you his peace. If you guys want to get some prayer, we'll have some prayer teams up here. Please come up and grab some prayer. Everybody needs it. But otherwise, please go. Have peace in the Lord. We love you guys. Have a good one.